Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Ottawa, where the Canadian government continues its bid to kill two human rights tribunal rulings. Today, Canada opposed an order expanding eligibility for Jordan's principle. The court battle is on day four, but the legal war has been raging for 14 years. Brett Forrester has the latest. Undaunted, Justice Department like counsel Robert Frater continued his legal offensive uh, on the Canadian Human Rights one, Tribunal. Where we say there was simply no evidence capable of supporting the decision made. That decision was in 2020 by the tribunal panel of Sophie Mark Kyldon and Edward Lustig. They ordered Canada to apply Jordan's principle to non-status First Nations kids. It said children will get services as long as they have or are eligible for Indian Act status, have one parent or guardian with or eligible for status, are recognized by their nation, or ordinarily live on reserve. Freighter told federal court justice Paul Favell this order is so irrational he should toss it out entirely. The attorney accuses the panel of moving the goalposts on a 14-year-old complaint originally about discriminatory funding practices. What the tribunal was doing here was simply making policy. There's no other way to describe it. They had no complaint before them about this group of individuals. No evidence that could substantiate a claim of discrimination. But the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society hit back. And all that was being considered here was whether these kids can ask for help. Council David Taylor said Canada still wants to, to prevent First Nations kids from accessing uh, essential year, services and still relies on discriminatory uh, law to justify dollars. discriminatory the conduct. Parents. The federal government clings to one of the, col the chief colonial instruments that Canada has wielded to wreak havoc on First Nations cultures over the, over the, over the decades that status under the Indian Act. Freighter told Favell the Caring Society may be right, but should have filed a constitutional challenge instead. The federal court hearings finish tomorrow, then it will be up to Favell to decide. Brett Forrester, APTN National News, Ottawa. BC First Nations, along with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, released over 60,000 sockeye fry to support salmon populations impacted by that big bar landslide. According to DFO, in 2019 and 2020, less than 1% of early Stewart sockeye entered the Fraser River from the Pacific Ocean to spawn. Last week, salmon fry were released in a creek north of Fort St. James as part of an emergency enhancement to help at-risk sockeye survive. Planning for the releases started in 2019 by DFO and Upper Fraser Fisheries Conservation Alliance which includes dozens of First Nations. They hope the fry will imprint on the creeks, make the journey to the Pacific Ocean, and then migrate back up the Fraser River in the coming years. We're extremely hopeful that these um, conservation efforts with regards to enhancement will make a change. At the very least, they're protecting those, those stocks from um, and protecting their, bio, their diversity and their genetic integrity. An Edmonton advocate is asking for more to be done to help protect murdered and missing Indigenous peoples. APTN's Chris Stewart talked to Stephanie Harp, who speaks for those who no longer can. Stephanie Harp lost her mother to violence when she was just 19 years old. Ruby Ann McDonald was murdered in 1999. Her murder went unsolved. Harp says the police did not investigate her mother's death fully because she was indigenous. Shortly after her mother's death, Harp was also attacked in Edmonton. A man put her in a chokehold from behind. She thought she was going to die. She fought back with a nail file, escaped, and ran to a gas station. The attendant called 911. Get me some help. Police were on the phone. Asked them what happened. Just told him I was attacked, I was attacked, someone tried to kill me, someone tried to kill me, and they asked, what nationality is she? And I, back, well, then I said, I'm, I'm Aboriginal, I'm Aboriginal. And they never came, they hung up the phone, they never came, followed up and anything, I waited there. Then I walked home, I walked home in my bare feet that night, 
thinking, I almost died, and they didn't care. She says the years after her mother's death was a dark period. Alcohol, drugs, gangs. Herp did get clean and became an advocate for murdered, missing, and exploited indigenous peoples. She hosted a TED Talk and speaks at seminars to help prevent violence. She founded the Stephanie Harp Experience Band. She says 20 years later after her mother's murder and the unprovoked attack, not much has changed with attitudes of the police towards indigenous peoples. This happens a lot. This is very, very common, unfortunately. And here we are back then, and here we are today. And it's, hopefully we see some more change here. Harp suggests ways to help reduce violence. Improving education and following traditional ways are key. She says governments must invest more to help. Language, tradition, culture, these things we used to be outlawed, need to be higher, higher elevated into this structure of change. We need more awareness of safety. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing crimes in Canada. It is not at the forefront of anything. So that awareness needs to be more at the forefront. Harp says a national program is necessary to help lower the number of missing and murdered Indigenous peoples. We should have our own Indigenous Amber Alert fully, fully funded. Fully funded when time any Indigenous person goes missing, there is this national Amber Alert. And I think that needs to be um, investigated, it needs to be built. Stephanie Harp will be asking leaders, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to support that plan. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. The leader of the BC First Nation, where the remains of 215 children were found at a residential school, says the final report detailing the discovery will be complete by the end of June. We grieve the latest findings brought to light with the help of science. This does not make any loss any less. The horrors any softer or the tragedy any lighter. Please take the time to heal and reflect and to pace yourself for the journey ahead and look after each other. Cookby, Roseanne Kashmir also expressed gratitude for the overwhelming support the community has received. Thousands have visited a memorial at the site to pay their respects. The Kashmir is urging people to avoid unnecessary travel and follow health protocols. Now for our special series stories of survival. APTN's Tina House meets Barb McNabb who says she endured brutal punishment daily while at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Barbara McNabb Larson was raised by her grandparents on the Skeechistin Reservation and says that before she was forced to attend the Kamloops Indian Residential School, her life was idyllic. My life before school was wonderful. Uh, we never went without. My grandparents were hard-working people. Uh, we had a beautiful farm up there. Uh, my grandfather had an orchard. We had bees. We had milk cow. My grandmother had a um, commercial, uh, a big uh, market garden. At the age of five, everything changed when they came to get her and other kids from the reservation. The first year, I believe they came up in a livestock truck and took us down into Kamloops. Barb says she didn't understand at such a young age why she was taken to that residential school, and she just remembers being scared. They cut off all our hair, then they deloused us scrubbed us down with louse formula and then after that they took us in and they scrubbed us down with disinfectants until you know they just rubbed us really with brushes and cloths and to disinfect us like we were diseased little animals or something. McNabb Larson says her horrific memories of the Kamloops Indian Residential School include receiving corporal punishments as a child including having to kneel by her bed for long periods of time until she couldn't walk temporarily. 
we used to have to stand. They'd had lines in the gym, and we used to have to stand with our toes right on the line. Stand with your back straight, and if you didn't stand up straight enough, they'd come along with a pointer stick, and you'd get a whap on the butt to straighten you up. And another thing I, I remember, and these are things that happened to me, um, being bent over on the bed and strapped with a strap. And they strapped you till you cried, because if you didn't cry, it didn't hurt enough. She wanted to do the interview here out on the land because for her, it's her healing place. Today, her husband Mel is right beside her, supporting her as she shares her painful past. That's one of the things that residential school does to you. It kind of kills the feelings in you. The old saying, you know, you beat the Indian out of the child. You don't only beat the Indian out of the child. You sometimes goes to the point where you beat the humanity out of the child. With the shocking discovery of the 215 children found, she says it really hit home for her and felt a sense of grief she's never felt before. Just the thought of those babies, what kind of monsters can kill a three-year-old child and then just dump them in a grave? And I feel that had I not left the school when I did, because um, I was a bad influence on the other children, so it was best I left. But I, I would probably be one of them they're digging up now. Tina House, APTN National News, Skeechiston. Barb, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, we'll continue our series on stories of survival tomorrow night. Time to step aside for a quick break. Coming up, the latest efforts to combat vaccine hesitancy. Welcome back. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health is Canada's largest mental health teaching hospital and is, leading research, is a leading research center in its field. This week, they partnered with MPP Sol Mamakwa and released an educational video addressing vaccine hesitancy. Daryl Stranger tells us more. I believe that one of the reasons that we have been prioritized is because it is addressing the extensive racism and discrimination that has been experienced by First Nations, Inuit and Métis people within the healthcare system in Canada. This educational video aims to address vaccine hesitancy in Indigenous communities. The video is a partnership between Ontario MPP Saul Mamakwa and the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health's Shkabe Makwa in Ontario. Shkabe Makwa is a new center of innovation for First Nations Inuit and Métis wellness, which supports um, various areas around mental health and substance use. Um, we drive culturally relevant system initiatives and, um, you know, kind of work with medical knowledge and traditional um, healing pathways. And Dr. Rennie Linklater is from Rainy River First Nations in Ontario. She hopes the video will help viewers realize the benefits of getting vaccinated beyond protecting themselves. So what we're hoping is that those who, you know, are maybe contemplating getting the vaccine will um, kind of think through the, the opportunity to, um, you know, understand that the vaccine really will help us uh, keep us safe. It'll protect ourselves. It'll protect our families. And it will also, um, you know, reduce the spread that's currently happening within our communities. Mamakwa says because of the extra barriers Indigenous people face, getting the vaccine can help protect our way of life. I think uh, for the safety of our, uh, uh, the way of life, the safety of our communities, the safety of our elders, uh, the safety of uh, our children, we need to take the vaccine and make sure that, uh, you know, I encourage people to take that because of those, uh, we've got to save our languages, we've got to save our way of life. The video can be found on the Center for Addiction and Mental Health website at camh.ca. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. In celebration of the 25th National Indigenous Peoples Day, APTN is once again welcoming the summer solstice with a unique adaption of APTN Indigenous Day Live this year. Snotty Nose Res Kids, Buffy St. Marie, Isque, and many more are among the artists performing during Sunday's three and a half hour long concert. Also performing is Tom Wilson, who joins us now from Hamilton, Ontario. 
Tom, thanks for being with us. Uh, I'm a big fan, so uh, pleasure to have you. Uh, what can we expect from your performance on Sunday night? Well, I believe uh, I'm doing um, a few songs that have been inspired over the last uh, nine years now. I can't even believe it. But nine years ago, uh, let me just put it this way, I found out that I was not a big, puffy sweaty Irish guy I was actually a Mohawk at the age of 53 from a complete stranger I found out that I was adopted and uh, and uh, as I was driving my cousin Janie home uh, after that a couple weeks after I found out I mentioned to her I said uh, cousin my cousin Jane is the matriarch of our family she sits at the head of the table for Christmas Thanksgiving all the kids birthdays right and I'm driving her home, and uh, I said, Janie, I found out uh, a couple weeks ago that mom and dad weren't my mom and dad, and if you remember anything, please tell me. And she turned to me and said, Tom, uh, I don't know how to tell you this. Uh, I hope you forgive me, but I'm your mother. I've known Janie my entire life. She's been in my life constantly as my cousin Jane. Janie is a, a Mohawk from Ganawage. My father was a Mohawk from Ganawage. Uh, I'm a Mohawk from Hamilton, Ontario. That that um, that inspired not only a book and uh, my visual art now, but all my uh, music uh, is uh, inspired um, by the last from the last nine years, and uh, my music is is now my writing and my art is to uh, shine a, uh, a light on the Mohawk Nation. So that's my job now um, as an artist and uh, as a man. And it's a truly incredible story, fascinating book that I would recommend to anyone. Uh, Tom, sadly, due to the pandemic, we won't be able to watch these performances in person again this year for Indigenous Day Live. Uh, how has the pandemic impacted your work over the past 15 months or so? I, I am embarrassed, not embarrassed, but I'm, I'm shy to say that I have thrived uh, for the last year and a half. Um, I did a show for uh, the last show. The big show that I did was at the National Arts Center in Ottawa for the Inspire Awards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I left that and uh, took really sick. And then the uh, then the big shutdown happened. The world shut down. And I went to my art studio and started painting. I uh, went to my desk where I am right now and started writing the second book for uh, Random House. So I have found it uh, an oasis uh, for creativity and uh, inspiration and uh, the energy that's come my way because the world has been shut down has is, is been, is, is been impactful on me. I always sat to write and paint, usually late at night after the world had calmed down and, and uh, the, you know, the, the city got quieter and people were... We're not bustling around, man. And uh, with the pandemic as it is, I find that that energy level of the world is just calm in some ways, at least for me, you know? Mm -hmm. It isn't calm when you get behind the wheel of a car and drive. Everybody's driving like crazy these days. I don't know what the hell's going on. But the, the world is certainly uh, about to explode in, in some areas. But uh, as far as uh, uh, artistic and creative energy goes, it's, it's been uh, very positive for me. Well, part of that uh, energy, I guess, uh, came out earlier this month when you and Iskwe teamed up for a new single, Starless Night. Uh, can mm -hmm. we expect you two to perform together on Sunday night? Uh, yeah, we're going to do, uh, um, in fact, uh, we're each doing our own performances and then we're getting together to do a couple songs together. And uh, the fantastic and exciting thing about working with this way, besides her being an extreme talent, um, insightful human being, uh, sensitive and loving, um, she's also a vicious performer. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, working with her on stage is fantastic. And we're, we're, we're finding material as we go along. We recorded two songs, and they were both released uh, by um, uh, on a record label, Indigenous record label, and uh, Red Music Rising. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just keep finding more material uh, to, to sing.
So uh, a lot of what we're doing is being made up as we go along. It's kind of it, the Isquay Tom Wilson project is kind of uh, art in real time, I guess you would say. Well, Tom, really looking forward to uh, Sunday night's performances and an absolute pleasure to have you join us. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And you can catch Tom and everybody else perform this Sunday when Indigenous Day Live airs on APTN from 8 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. That's Eastern Time. And the show will repeat numerous times this coming Monday. Well, stick around. We've got more to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Gail French from Oneida Nation in Ontario was able to capture a photo of an eagle perched upon an Anukshuk outside of her home. That's pretty crazy. That's something you see every day. You can keep those photos coming by sending them to share at aptn.ca and be sure to tune in every day to see if your photo is our next photo of the day. Time now to take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 25 and sunny for Halifax and Charlottetown. 10 with rain in Nain, cloudy, and 22 for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Showers in 26 in Montreal, rain in 25 in Chibugamu. Showers in 24 for Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay. 25 with rain in Thunder Bay, 17 with showers for Sioux Lookout. 18 in Thompson and Churchill, rain and 14 for God's Lake. 20 and cloudy in Winnipeg, 21 with showers for Dauphin. Sunny and 22 in Regina, 22 with rain for Saskatoon. 21 in showers in Meadow Lake, 19 in Uranium City. In northern Alberta, 22 with showers for Fort McMurray, 18 in rain in high level. 23 with the sun out in Edmonton, sunny and 26 for Lethbridge. Sunny and 22 in Vancouver, 1 degree cooler in Victoria. 14 with showers in Dease Lake, rain and 19 in Prince George. 27 with rain in Old Crow, cloudy and 21 in Whitehorse. Sun's out and 24 for Yellowknife and Wrigley, 25 in Norman Wells. 5 with rain in Saks Harbor, plus 4 in Politak. 10 in Chesterfield, showers and 14 for Arviette. 3 in Resolute, snow and plus 1 in Igloo Lake. Well, last but certainly not least, two of our reporters have won Canada's highest prize for public service journalism. Cullen Crozier and Kenneth Jackson took home the 2020 Michener Award for their stories of three sisters who died by suicide while in Ontario's child welfare system. Here they are accepting the award virtually last night. You know, I've always said this, the supporting is not about any one reporter or even APTN. It's about the children, it's about the care, it's about what's important. Thank you to the Michener Awards Foundation for highlighting our work this year and the work of journalists from across Turtle Island. Masi Cho. And a huge congrats to Cullen and Kenneth from all of us here on such a prestigious award and for the incredible journalism they do. You can find their reporting and much more, of course, over on our website, aptnnews.ca. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night.